Now let's look at a multiple subtraction design. So the idea here is to triangulate on the association between event type A, some event type, and a particular process by subtracting away multiple kinds of events. And this helps us avoid some of the issues with pure insertion if the different control conditions I'm subtracting off each have uh, different kinds of, of um, characteristics and, and each of them is potentially uh, confusable with the, the process of interest in different ways. So a case study here is studies of the fusiform face area by Nancy Kamwisher et al. Uh, and they did some really nice studies and here's a slide from, from one of them um, in which faces are compared with many different kinds of things. So they compare faces with objects, but of course those differ in their different spatial frequencies. So they compare intact faces with scrambled faces, faces where the basic spatial frequencies are, are preserved. Um, faces with houses, faces with hands, uh, so maybe it's about body parts, they can control for body parts, faces with animal faces, faces with pictures of faces, or drawings of faces, and, and other conditions. So really across these multiple subtractions, they are trying to triangulate on the idea that uh, the FFA is activated when you see a face, but not when you do other things. Let's look now at a process overlap or dissociation design. And one way of thinking about this is, um, is to think in terms of double dissociation, which goes back to the neuropsychology literature from way back. And the idea is that task A activates uh, more than task B in one area, and I can find another area of the brain in which B activates more than A. And this implies separate processes in, in A and B. Um, so this isn't knockdown drag out evidence for separable processes because you can get nonlinear effects that can sort of cause that double dissociation. Um, but it's pretty good evidence on, on process separability. A stronger argument is called separate modifiability. So let's say we have task A activates one area but B does not and B activates uh, another area but not A. So now we have the double dissociation, but with the added constraint that there's really no response to, to the thing that doesn't activate the area, it activates it less. And this implies separable processes in uh, A and B. So let's look at an example of this from a recent study uh, from our lab for convenience. And the, uh, the issue here was, do physical pain and romantic rejection share common brain representations, especially in the dorsal anterior cingulate, which is where we're going to focus now. And so what we're going to do is compare patterns of activity, this is multivariate, that are predictive of heat pain versus patterns that are predictive of viewing pictures of the ex-partner relative to their respective control conditions. So what we see here is that we can identify a pattern within the anterior cingulate of activity where the response in that pattern uh, overall responds to physical pain more than to, to warmth, its control condition, but there's no additional response to the ex-partner, which is the rejection condition, versus the friend. So that's one half of a double dissociation or separate modifiability process. Now, let's see, we can identify another pattern, which is tracking rejection. And this pattern responds significantly to the rejection event, ex-partner, but there's no response to heat, to painful heat. So what does that mean? That means uh, that these two conditions and these two patterns are separate mo separately modifiable. Um, so the representations of pain and, and, and rejection at least by these measures, in the dorsal anterior cingulate are not shared. Let's now look at factorial designs, which is another basic way of enhancing our inferential power. So in a factorial design, I manipulate two factors at once, and I can test for uh, dissociations in the areas that are activated, and I can also test for interactions between the two factors. So um, here's an example. It's a task switching experiment where people view these complex objects with, with shapes and orientations on the screen. And the upshot is that there are four different types of attention shifts in this experiment. And they're grouped into two factors. So in factor one, people are switching between uh, an attribute of the object, let's say whether a, an object is sort of vertically or horizontally aligned, that when it's held in memory, they have to remember and read off memory. 
Um, and factor two is what we'll call an external switch, where the objects are available on screen and they have to shift the focus of their attention from one to the other. And in the study, people could do either type of switch or both uh, simultaneously. So the four trial types there uh, cover the two by two factorial space. And the maps at the bottom just show you some, some of the activations in internal task switching in the frontal cortex to external task switching in the frontal cortex in the posterior uh, areas. And then there are also some interactions. And interactions are where um, something special happens when you have to switch both things at once, uh, something on the screen and something internal. And that happened in the insula. So this is just one example among many of how we can employ factorial design uh, approaches in our experiments in brain imaging. Our final example is a parametric modulation design. And this is one in which I can manipulate variables in a parametric fashion within person, usually with three or more levels. Um, we can also just use measured variables like performance or emotion ratings or other things like that. And a nice thing about this is that it can also help with the specificity of our inferences. It can provide stronger evidence than basic contrasts for uh, that there's a relationship between brain activity in an area or a voxel and the the process that you're studying, that you've manipulated parametrically. So here are two of my favorite examples from early research. On the left, what you see is um, blood flow on the y-axis increasing as complexity in a Tower of London task, which is a task that involves reasoning and executive function, increases. And we're looking at the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. And what you can see here is that there is a graded parametric increase in the blood flow as the task complexity increases. So that increases our confidence that the DLPFC activity is related to performance or, or task performance in some way. On the right, we're looking at the ventromedial prefrontal cortex. And here, there are five levels that involve different, different levels. There are the different levels of the goal or purchase value of an item. So people were asked to say, how much do you want to buy this hat? Uh, how much do you want to buy this, this pencil or this you know, mug? And, um, and when people said, no, I don't value that very much, the activity is low, and the more they value that item, the more there's a parametric increase in the level of brain activity, this time in the ventromedial prefrontal cortex. So there are many examples, but these are some of my favorites of parametric modulation designs. And we'll look at examples of how to do all of these designs statistically when we talk about the general linear model. So let's wrap up. We've talked about several kinds of designs. Subtraction designs, basic contrast. Individual differences designs, correlations between brain and behavior across individuals. We've talked about process overlap and dissociation designs, which involve multiple comparisons, and uh, in some cases, the logic of double dissociation or separate modifiability. Um, we've talked about factorial designs, and we've talked about parametric modulation. So that wraps up this module, and thanks for your attention. See you next time.